right now, we're going to welcome our main speaker, who is Kevin Bowling of the Secular Student Alliance. He is the executive director of the Secular Student Alliance, serving since 2017. He brings with him 20 years of nonprofit leadership experience. His career has included over 10 years of student association management and on-campus program development from Los Angeles to Boston. For 10 years, Kevin served as the executive director of the California Thoroughbred Horsemen's Foundation, a charitable trust serving the healthcare needs of the industry's largest immigrant workforce. Kevin worked in higher education administration, in student services, and in leadership for over 15 years. And as many members of our community know, the Secular Student Alliance is very important and we are thrilled to have him here today. Um, so take it away and thank you so much for being here. Uh, my pleasure, I'm very glad to be, to be here with you. And just before I start, just a, a thank you. I, Houston Oasis uh, sponsored one of our student scholarships this year. So we just announced those uh, last week. And so I think uh, from your group choosing, there's an amazing an, a number of uh, students that we have. And so thank you for participating in that. Thank you for recognizing our students and thank you for helping them uh, through that process. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will just jump right into the presentation. There we go. So we should be on with everyone just, and again, a quick welcome. Um, Again, my name is Kevin Bowling with the Secular Student Alliance. Just a little, go over a little bit what we're talking about today. One is the, sort of the mindset of the upcoming generation, uh, the changing world on the college campus and how we see that, uh, ways that local groups and people can engage the next generation, so new people, younger people, um, some specific things that you can do. And of course, I know you'll have a sort of uh, breakout rooms and come back. And so any questions that you have, happy to answer those uh, as well as we go along. So want to answer any questions that you specifically have. So with the Secular Students Alliance, just a little bit of information. Uh, we are part of the secular community. Um, we're the only national organization dedicated to working with atheist humanists and other non-theist students. So non-religious students, um, we look at, we're working really with the future leaders of the secular movement, but also future leaders who will have secular values are not yet, and working in our communities all across the country. Um, so we started in 2000. We're just celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And uh, we st started in uh, Ohio and have sort of spread across the, the, the United States. Uh, as a bitch of the Secular Student Alliance is part of the larger secular movement. We, I think many people uh, are familiar with Camp Quest, also working with students and summer camps and beginning a day camp process. Um, and of course, we look at sort of taking the students working with Camp Quest and really being a feeder uh, to larger organizations within the secular movement. Um, so with that also, we look at, if I think if you look at uh, interns and uh, in employees in almost all of these organizations, there are members of the Secular Student Alliance in their ranks. So uh, we're very proud of that. We think our students go on to do great things, not only in their own lives, but also within the secular community. So again, we're, uh, so at, we look at, it wasn't that long ago that about one in five of the US, US population identified as non-religious. That's currently about one in four. For students, that's about one in three. And there's actually a new survey out uh, that says about 47% of students are identifying as non-religious. So that's within a couple years, we went from really one in three to one in two. So this demographic is changing quickly. And I think within the next few years, the majority of young people will identify as non-religious. So it's sort of a tipping point in the United States where that's about to change. I was just saying it's a fun little thing. This is Bailey Harris. She's uh, she started one of our first middle school chapters uh, in Utah. So, you know, and I think so. You may be familiar. She's just started. She's writing her third book. Um, so phenomenal young woman. Uh, and so and I just find she's also just cute as a button. Um, so a little bit what we're talking about here is the next generation uh, and. I always like to sort of, you know, think about your organization, uh, the, the demographics, the population, uh, when we sort of start this, and we'll sort of see how that sort of trans, translates at the, at the end. But uh, just a little bit about them. Um, 
So the incoming class of university students now is going to be the class of, of 2024. Uh, Beloit College always does the mindset. So uh, things that happened in our society that really sort of influence how these incoming students uh, see the world and, you know, and how they interact with the world. And so this is just a few bit of highlights of that for you to sort of get a better understanding of this incoming group. So uh, ever since um, what 9-11, uh, is sort of a historic event for them, just like uh, Pearl Harbor was for their grandparents and the Kennedy assassination was for their parents. The US has been, in, been at war the entire time they've been alive. Uh, they grew up with uh, the Patriot Act and increasing surveillance of terrorism within our homeland. Um, Donald Trump has always been a political figure, uh, first as a Democrat, independent, now as, well, as a Republican and, and soon to be unemployed. Um, Phil was always Hillary's uh, aging husband. Uh, every four years, there's a conversation about why do we have the Electoral College. Enron has never existed. Chernobyl has never produced any electricity. Uh, cloning has always been a routine laboratory uh, procedure. Uh, autism has always been erroneously linked uh, to vaccines. Uh, birth control pill has always, always been in existence. See some, the, the motto, see something, say something, has been around the entire time that, that they have been alive. Columbine was their Sandy Hook. So, and they're the first generation to openly acknowledge that they can expect to have a school time shooting at any time. Uh, on a little more casual, uh, a lighter aspect, Starbucks has always been serving cafe lattes in China's Forbidden City. Uh, many of us grew up with Encyclopedia Britannica on our bookshelves. They have just simply gone to the internet with Wikipedia, where all of that information is, is available to them at their fingertips. There's always been Survivor. Uh, snowboarding has always been an Olympic sport. Uh, Troy Aikman has always been uh, calling the shots in the media booth and flyovers and God Bless America have always been reinforcing our uh, patriotism at uh, sporting events. Ketchup has always come in green. Pink slime has always been in existence. Uh, they will argue with their parents over what the first episode of Star Wars is. Uh, they have probably never heard the real uh, login uh, for uh, America Online. The Mars, uh, Mars uh, Odyssey has always been circling Mars in search of water. Um, they have been able to uh, be checked in on at any point uh, through nanny cams. Uh, over the internet. They've been able to use their fingerprints as their identification. Uh, they don't really care about email. And so they're all about texting and instant communication. Snapchat is their favorite app. Uh, their phones have always been used to take pictures primarily. They've always had smartwatches. Uh, so this generation is about as uh, unjudgmental about sexual orientation as their parents were about smoking pot. Interesting conversation about drugs before we came on today. Um, and about uh, only about two thirds of this generation identifies as exclusively heterosexual, which is changing fast. Uh, their sophomore, or their, about 40% of their generation identifies as uh, people of color. And if you, you sort of look at their, in their generation, they've seen two African-American secretaries of state, uh, a black president be elected, Disney's first black princess, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. And of course, we have our first black woman uh, vice presidential candidate very soon. Uh, next year, their sophomore year, they will make up a quarter of the US population. And then we sort of throw in coronavirus. And so this is clearly something very new, but it's going to have, it's already having a dramatic uh, change on their college experience and how this really plays out. We'll really get to see it in, in the future. Uh, so, so this is, I always like to throw in a little bit about generations. We sort of have the baby boomers that a lot of people are familiar with and then the millennials. And so millennials make up generation X, Y, and Z. And I always joke, we're at Z, no more, no more generations after this. Uh, but really what we're talking about right now is, and it's going into college, is generation, uh, uh, generation Z and the impact that they have. So why are millennials so important? Why is there so much conversation about millennials? So 80 million in the US, the largest generation, and there's 2.5 billion worldwide. 
And I, no surprise, they grew up alongside technology and they're very used to social media. We find the youngest of that generation, Generation uh, Z, really understands that social media is uh, temporary, should be, should be temporary, uh, and they're much more concerned about privacy. So, and why they matter, as it, you know, mentioned right now, they make up about 50% of the workforce and will be 75% of the workforce in just 10 years. Um, so big, big generation coming through. And again, not a surprise, extreme technoholics, five, they're usually, have, they live our life about five different screens. It's integrated into their life. And again, temporary privacy, extremely important to this generation. Uh, but they're talking about real time connection. So they're looking at being able to talk with anyone, video chat with anyone across the world at any time in real time life. Um, and they're using this power to be extremely creative and extremely collaborative. Um, so the, the access that they have to knowledge and to that connection is tremendous. So, and I think we've all learned a little bit with coronavirus and our uh, sort of addiction uh, or necess the, uh, being necessary to use Zoom and those sorts of platforms. So when we look at the Secular Student Alliance primarily, uh, there's the larger world of the non-religious. And what really we're looking for is more that category, atheist, humanist, and those sorts of things. And so we did some survey work with our students on who they are and sort of, you know, did it, getting some demographics. Um, and so, was, so we looked at our, our students and said, how do you identify now? And so, we left this open. We didn't define this. We let them choose their own definitions. And so atheist was by far the largest single identifier that our students uh, and younger people are using. But clearly there's a broad spectrum of, of uh, how they choose to identify. Um, one of the most important things what doesn't show, you, you will quickly see none, you know, if you add these up, it does not have to, uh, add up to 100 because the most popular category that they chose was they picked three or four identifiers on how they identify themselves. So organizations who, and, uh, and we've talked with American Atheist, American Humanist, um, Freedom From Religion Foundation, those things, they're not picking one sp specific identifier, very much with the LGBTQ community, as, we, uh, you know, as they get younger and younger, they're not solely gay or lesbian, it's queer, it's gender non-conforming, we're coming up with new titles, and that's much more fluid, and they do that. We find the same thing with our students and how they identify sort of their non-religious aspects. Um, we wanted to know, are we just a home for students who you know, are atheist and grew up atheist? And so we asked, what your childhood home, what was the religious atmosphere like there? And only about 13% said that they grew up in a secular or non-religious household. Clearly the large majority in Christianity, uh, if you look down at the bottom, the other, that's primarily Mormon. So not wanting, to, so self, not self-identifying as Christian, but specifically saying they're Mormon. So we definitely know that we are, are a home for people who grew up primarily in religious uh, households and through college, this integral time where you sort of examine who you are as a person, you leave a little bit, you take what your, your parents and your family sort of put in, but you really start to examine that for yourselves. And we see that there is a larger sense of that deconversion. And from the numbers before, how quickly that is happening, especially right now. Um, so we looked at political, uh, you know, no one's been talking about politics lately, uh, but we did look at the sort of the political identity. We do have, we know that we have students who the wide range of the political spectrum. We do have people who identify as conservative, slightly conservative, uh, but clearly the large majority of our students are identifying as liberal, strongly liberal, more in the progressive realm. Um, when talking about politics, I think one thing that, you know, and this is a little bit more global perspective, um, was from some of the uh, Pew and PRI studies, about 56% of atheists self-identify as liberal. Uh, but I think once we get into sort of what some of those particular beliefs are, I think that changes quickly. So again, they, it's that, the title there, but we look support of the government for the poor, always, you know, 70, almost 75%. So abortion should be legal, almost 90%, you know, and women's reproductive health, those sorts of things, you know, almost 95% accepting of homosexuality, and then almost 80% thinking that we should have stronger laws protecting our environment. So clearly much more progressive ideals and how uh, our generation, you know, I think atheists in general, but also the younger generation feels about these issues. The interesting to me was a larging percentage of people, the right and wrong depends on the situation. 
And so there's, there's no looking on this higher being to tell us what is right and wrong. We actually get to decide that for ourselves and our own morals and values and how we live those out in our lives, whether we choose to help help other people and end suffering and care for our environment and be more accepting of equality and those sorts of things. And we find our students continually gravitate uh, in, in those realms. So a quick look at the changing campus. Um, so I just will touch a little bit upon this. I um, mean, clearly with COVID, this is, it's a little bit different now, uh, but the, some of the same models still provide. So campus colleges are a hotbed for campus-based ministries. Um, and we see that. So there'll be sometimes as many as 120 different religious organizations and one secular student alliance. Uh, so a few years ago, about 12 of the largest uh, campus ministries got together because they realized about 70% of Christian students, their first year on campus were leaving the faith. And so there wasn't a real definition on what that meant. And my guess is, my guess is that they stopped showing up for the meetings or student organizations or whatever religious services they were having. Um, and so, of course, as you can imagine, the, the Christian groups were a little bit worried about this. And so they formed campus, you know, campus link. So millions of dollars over a couple months. Um, and they, they're joint as a joint effort between all the 12 to rejuvenate God preference uh, presence on college campus. And so their goal was to double the amount of religious students on campuses. Now, clearly the numbers are working against them, but millions of dollars instantly. And, and some of the background to this is Project Blitz. Uh, which I, if you follow any of the national organizations, I'm sure you're Kevin, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, so with Project Blitz, uh, so uh, and then this is a lot of where in the God Trust uh, posters and those sort of things came out in schools. And so this is something that clearly affects our students a lot. And we, uh, there we go. So uh, religious organizations, highly organized, actively prophetizing, and extremely well-funded. So a little bit about our students. I'll just touch on this thing that we know that they're interested in. Uh, some interesting things, a part of our survey, we looked at our student leadership and our student membership are very similar in demographics. Um, and so about 50% uh, male and female. Um, we know that about 40% of our uh, students identify as uh, people of color or of mixed race. Uh, about 20% of our students identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and another 5% saying that they identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. So uh, for a lot of the large national organizations, I said those, those demographics are very different. Um, I think uh, Oasis and e even Sunday Assembly tend to to gravitate a little bit younger and a little bit more diverse, um, but still I think the upcoming generation is much more of that. Um, so clearly separation of church and state, uh, important to our, our students and they do a, a lot of activism around this. Um, also the environment, uh, racial justice, uh, LGBT rights, uh, women's reproductive health, making sure that their campuses are safe places, uh, Regist voter registration, extremely important and increasing. I think if you've seen the, some of the numbers about the 18 to four, uh, 24 demographic and how they have been voting um, and their activity in voting, I mean, astronomical percentages from 2016. Uh, we have students who do voter registration on campuses and the Secular Student Alliance actually this year uh, led the Secular America Votes program uh, for the secular community. So our students are highly engaged in this. Uh, the other thing is customer service. This is a group we started. We have a secular spring break, um, which we started. There are many uh, spring break programs that are religiously geared. We wanted something for our students. And so we actually went to Puerto Rico uh, two years ago uh, and were rebuilding homes uh, um, in Yabaco, which is where Hurricane Maria came ashore. So a fantastic group of students who did volunteer service there for a week. Um, this past year, we actually had students in the Bahamas and Great Abaco Island rebuilding there. Corona hit right in the middle of that, and uh, so we had to sort of we had to get, work to get them home very quickly. But we actually this past year we had we're going to do two weeks of service with two different groups of students. So this has continued to grow, and our students are amazing. 
uh, out there. I get a little choked up every time I talk about it because it's very, it was such an amazing experience and that working with our students was so cool. Um, so that's a little bit about our students in this generation. I was like, are you ready? So I, th I think this is a very gener different generation and a lot of groups look very different than, uh, than our students. Usually when I do in-person presentations, this is always where I get a little bit of the nervous laughter going, no, we're really not. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is really how do we make those connections with younger and newer people? Um, so, and how do you want to get younger people involved? So a little bit of millennials, they're the, the generation that grew up teaching themselves stuff. So uh, I think they're not stuck in these rigid environments uh, of what people have been doing for 50 years. So it's often easy for people in groups who have been there to get frustrated. Like, why are they questioning these things? And why do they keep asking us about how, why don't we do it this way? And why don't we do it that way? And the reality is, is they're not trying to frustrate you. It's literally the way they think and what they do. Again, creators, collaborators, looking at things in new ways. So part of for, for established groups is be open to that. Realize they're not challenging you. They're literally just asking these questions because that's the way they pretty much see the world. And they're asking these questions all the time. Um, so, because we're looking for them to, how do we get them to join? How do we get them to build community? How do we get them to be part of your community and to form those sort of relationships? And so we look at some of the stuff that you can do. What I'm gonna to touch on is a little bit about uh, welcoming inclusive talk, uh, intergenerational and separate spaces, some active projects, and then what benefits your groups that make you special. And I don't think as a secular movement, we talk about this a lot. And I think that's a good things for us to do. I, a little caveat. There's nothing wrong with liking what your group is doing now. And my assumption though, is that you want to have your group open to attracting new people and younger people. So at that same time, I have to, you know, if you don't want to change anything, you don't want new people. And that's okay. Just be honest and have that conversation with yourselves. So if, if you don't want to do anything new, you won't have new people. So part of change and getting new people or part of getting new people is doing some things differently. Um, and again, it's you, for your organization to decide how, what you want to do and, and those sorts of things. So some of the things you can do, uh, social media, clearly, that's how students are interacting, how they're finding out about information. And clearly, I think from interacting with your group already, you're well further than many other uh, uh, organizations in the secular, local groups in the secular movement about doing this. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, advanced planning and promotion is super important. Um, so we know that, uh, that people are going to be looking on the internet for how to, you know, is transport, how do I get there, especially for college students? How do I get there? Is parking available for people with families? Is there childcare available? These are things that people want to know. They're going to go and look on your website. If they don't find this information, they're probably not going to, uh, you know, invest any further and, and make those sorts of, you know, make, make the effort to go. Um, so really having that information easily, easily there and people are now and more and more, there's so many things that people can do having that, to, you know, that advanced planning is super important. The other thing is sort of energetic or energetic leadership. So encouraging that participation and listening to new ideas, that doesn't mean you have to do everything. Uh, it's also a wonderful way if someone says, Hey, your website, you know, and I'm not, not picking on your organization, just for our general statement. Hey, your website looks a little drab. Um, and I had trouble finding this information. Oh my gosh, that's, you know, what would you suggest on how we can improve that? What are things that we can do to make it a little bit more exciting? Where can we put that in? What information would you like to see so that you know that we're more open to you and with your family and your friends and with, you know, with, with kids. So letting that be a spark to a conversation um, that sometimes can be a little challenging if you've got some ownership in that website or that flyer or that information. But again, just be open to that and start asking questions. Well, how can we? And then oftentimes, would you like to help? Uh, we know some local groups who have actually turned over their social media to younger people and go have, okay, here's our guidelines, but let's have some fun with this. And how can you take this and do new things with it? Uh, welcome to inclusive talk. I always have to give a little credit. Um, Emily with American Ethical Society and I were doing a presentation uh, and I stole most of this from her. Uh, so, okay, so I stole all of it from her. So uh, when we bring new people in our groups, it's very important, this, the setting that we're uh, creating and the questions that we're asking. And so one, and I've, I've heard many of these, I know Emily has heard many of these in some of the organizations she works with. She was like, oh my gosh, how old are you? Some people name that, that's not most always the most comfortable thing and automatically shows there's a difference between you and them. 
Um, so if they're you know after, at an event, what do you think of the event? Again, op that a sort of op open ended question about how you can participate um, and getting some information from them. Are you new here? You you know you don't know them. And you're sort of showing that, and it may show for them, like you're not familiar with everyone in your group and how friendly are you with other people? So um, so I don't think we've met, what's your name? Or my name is, and it's a great way to sort of introduce yourselves and start a conversation. Uh, do you have kids? So again, people may not always be interested in divulging information of people they don't know very well. So what brought you here today? You can start a conversation that they get to select that, you know what's important to them. And then that's the opportunity for you to be like, oh my gosh, well, we have this and we have this and we have this, things you may be interested. Let me introduce you to those people. Um, so are you in school, that same sort of thing, a little bit information, start by telling them about yourself. So, and, and that's a way to open up and th then they get, to the, they get to share what they're most interested in as well. Uh, I've seen this, a young person comes in, oh my gosh, we need more young people. Um, that's scary to young people because they're, they're like, okay, this is not the group for me. So great to meet you. Um, and the other one is, oh my gosh, let me meet you. To, let me introduce you to our other young person. So how about just introducing you to my friend? Um, so these are the way that we talk to people as they're entering our organizations or our groups are extremely important. And that just sometimes requires a little thought in how you do that. Make it open, allow people to share the information they want and make it sort of, you know, nice and friendly. Just it's some things we don't often think about uh, as we sort of move along. Social media, clearly uh, extremely important. I actually took down some of the social media slides because you guys really seem to be doing a much better job uh, as a lot of the other organizations. So I did go into a lot of that. Um, I will say is the meetup, it's you know extremely popular uh, for local secular groups, uh, but it doesn't really show what they're doing. And it's super static. There's no, the very, very little interaction. So we recommend platforms where we can show the activity. You can show pictures of what your group is. You can show people having a good time. You can be interactive in those things. So, so clearly Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we highly recommend. If you're only doing one, we recommend Facebook as a way to do that, which you guys clearly are. And we are actually sharing your live stream on our, our social, uh, on uh, our Facebook page as well. So great interactive way to do all that sort of stuff. Um, Again, stealing from a little bit. Um, so in looking at sort of what uh, so a, a group of U.S. churches did for young adults, um, so teenagers, on what they're looking at for as, as the, their perceptions of church. Um, so yes, you know, uh, so most students had, uh, looked at this and said, church is a place where I find answers to meaningful life. And that's a great thing. Um, I think we often sort of discount, there's a lot of things that religion does well in building community and getting people to feel like they're welcome in those sorts of things. So let's learn from those. There's some great things that they do. Um, and there's some other things that the bottom is where they start to have a little bit of trouble. Um, so is the church tolerant of different beliefs? Uh, you know, we're getting a decrease and we find a lot, we have religious members of the secular student organization because they say, I can't have conversations about doubt or questioning my religion. Um, so this is a great place where I get to have those conversations and I can be on one side and you guys be on the other. We can have thoughtful debates and they love that. So about science, I'm sure that's not a surprise. Um, looking at the church as being hypocritical. So their actions and their, what they're preaching do, are different things, not being a safe place to express doubts um, and then really you know, a little shallow. Those are things I think our groups are not. And again, these are great things for us to be sharing with young people and young families and as you know, a way to raise your, your, your uh, children or as a young person getting involved, these are things we should be promoting. It's where religion is primarily failing and where we excel. And, we, and I think we're doing much better job at community building. Um, I, I, stole, I just stole this. Uh, yesterday, Allison Gill and I were doing a presentation for Camp Quest um, and their new youth uh, youth survey for the secular movement is about to come out. Um, it'll be released on December 4th. So I, this is a very sneak preview because this is not out information yet. Um, but they looked at local group engagement and asking youth what were the, some of the most important things for them. So clearly, you know, what they participated in and what they were interested in. Uh, so social opportunities, debates and lectures were actually a little bit less. Volunteer opportunities, we're getting a little bit more. Advocacy opportunities, a little bit more. And resources for people with children. So again, getting more and more important in that. Um, and we'll often, I mentioned the sort of intergenerational and generational spaces. 
uh, for when we have in-person events and those sorts of things, it's great to have when we have the, the local group who has their meeting and then they go to the cafe around the corner, they have their exact same table, they all sit in the exact same seats. That's valuable, important. And those are great traditions to keep going. And there's the little, a little set. That's also not comfortable for a new person when they come in uh, and looking at, at those sorts of things. It's also great. I was at, uh, in uh, Arizona and they have a nice facility, which actually has a room that they can have their meetings in and a side where they have games and stuff for kids. So intergenerational spaces where, you know, the non-students can be, or the you know, non-children can be having a meeting and, or a, a debate or a presentation and the students can, uh, the, the children can have a space where they're being taken care of so the parents can focus on what they're doing. It's a great way to include multiple generations in those spaces and those sorts of things. So when we have those opportunities and clearly some of that is limited, but also active, you know, active uh, events, our students love uh, service projects. So that's going cleaning up a, a river or doing something in Houston. We have lots of things with Houston's and disaster relief um, and those sorts of things. So our students are highly involved in, in, in those events. Does that mean everyone in your organization may be able to participate? No. Some, some of the older people with mobility issues may say, or people with mobility issues may say, this is not the one for me. That's okay. Offering some different events for different people is a great sort of thing. But people are more and more looking for diversity of events and not just those lectures and debates and also looking at how am I going to bring my family into those sorts of things. Uh, the relationships are important. I ask all groups to think about, I, I would say, Every group has that sort of old grumpy old man. Um, so I said, if it, you don't know who that is, it may be you. I do that jokingly somewhat. Um, but you know, who's the best from your group to approach new people? Have someone who is, who is designated when you have those in-person events to be the welcome wagon, to introduce people, to find out who they are, to introduce themselves and make those connections. Um, so how is your group gonna outreach? Uh, you know, uh, you know, who's going to be doing it and how are you going to make people feel welcome? I think are the sort of three most important questions uh, that groups should start asking themselves. So I know we, I usually pause for questions. I know you're going to break into some smaller groups, have some discussions and those sorts of things. I will be here and happy to do uh, questions afterwards. And of course, if you ever have any uh, questions for me, you know, please feel free to contact me, email me. It's probably one of the easiest ways. Always happy to help local groups and those sorts of things. Oh, Thank you so much, Kevin. That was wonderful. Um, before we get to Q&A, we're going to break out into our discussion groups. You can hit join if you like or not. If you want to step away and fill, refill your coffee, you can use this time to say hello to other OACNs and think of some questions. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, it's a great time to post your questions to the comments. So we'll be back in about five minutes. So welcome back. Those of you that have been gone, I hope you had a wonderful time in the breakout rooms mm -hmm. visiting or uh, coming up with some questions. Uh, and truly, Kevin, I'm a teacher and I get what you're saying about these new kids. At first it was shocking and now it's really fun because I get them, you know, and I understand that you just can't stay in the past, you have to move forward um, or they'll just take off without you. Anyway, uh, so right now, we're gonna open it up for questions for anybody who wants to mention an idea that your breakout room came up with. As always, keep your questions and comments brief so we can get as many in as possible. We know everyone is muted. So if you have a question or comment, raise your hand and Abhishek will unmute you. I also believe you may have the ability to unmute yourself. So. With that, Abhishek. All right, the first question is, uh, is from Amy, uh, sorry, Amy. Uh, when we all get back, how do you present or reconcile the issue for the coming generations when they see scientists who are religious? Uh, I, th I think for many of the students that's, that we work with, um, it, uh, interfaith and people being religious is not that big of a deal. So we do a lot of interfaith work. Our students do a lot of interfaith work on campus. Um, so they are used to working with, with people of different religions and making that space. So freedom of and from religion. Um, so I think they buy into that, that 
very much. So I see, I think you see, uh, to use a couple of stereotypes and, and catchphrases, you see less of the angry atheist. Um, and our students really have this debates, are you a firebrand or are you sort of that friendly humanist? Um, and I think much more of our students are going, okay, there's people, religious people, your religion needs to be about you and not about imposing it on anybody else. That's where they will challenge if once that starts to happen. But other than that, they're they're pretty good. Our students in uh, at Southeast Missouri, they they're the ones who plan and host the interfaith conference. They invite the religious groups to come. One, so they're part of the conversation. But also, let's talk about all of these. And I think they think that presenting presenting the facts and presenting the information, students will make up their own mind. We see where the numbers are going. So I think our, our students are clearly pro-science, uh, that evidence should be used in public policy and supporting all of that. Um, so especially what's been happening the last four years, COVID, all of those sorts of things. So they're extremely, um, I think, up on the science stuff, but I don't think that they're gonna hold if a science who hap a scientist who happens to be religious, I don't think they're going to hold it against that person. They may be a little more skeptical. They may question a little bit more. They may examine where those those the those perspectives are coming from. But I don't think they're going to hold it against someone for being religious. And we find that they're becoming more open to people being religious. But again, your religion is about you, not about everybody else. Laura, you have a, Laura, you have a question. Would you like to ask it? Hi. <laughs> um, my question was, um, have you talked to these students who were raised religious about what the catalyst was for them um, leaving their childhood religion? Because for me, I'm 36 um, and it was how entwined Christianity had become with um, conservative politics mm -hmm. and that it felt like those couldn't be separated. So it was largely, it started as a political thing for me. I'm just wondering if something similar has happened, uh, with people who are younger than me. And I think, I think for a lot of people, uh, uh and I think this spans generation, there was probably for a lot of people, there's, uh, I, one event or one catalyst that you can somewhat usually point to to go, this is what started the spark of doubt for me. Um, and so I think that is, depending on who you are as a person um, and what your experiences are, for me, it was around gay and lesbian issues. And, and again, sort of that you say you're open to everyone and you know, we're all God's children, but yet I'm really not as a gay man. And so for me, that was a, you know, I know that was a, a delineation from religion and for many LGBT people that is clearly a delineation from, from religion. So I think it varies a little bit, but I think with your sort of current day, um, current day religion and how conservative and evangelical it's getting, it is that hypocrisy oftentimes. Um, it is we, and more and more we should be caring for people um, and we're not. So it's a lot of it that the hypocrisy and the dichotomy between what you're saying and what you're doing, who really, I think, really starts to, to push people out. Um, and I, there's also, you know, that's uh, a bit of the tribalism and this is what we preach and this is what you have to believe. And students are seeing that younger people are seeing that they have different experience in the people of different cultures that they meet, the people of different colors that they meet, the people of different sexual orientations they meet, the people of different genders that they meet religion is so stuck in its realm, their world and how they experience it, they're going, this is, doesn't match. And so there has to be other answers. And I think for a large part that, that it, that's what it is. And not just the people they meet in person, the vast world of the internet and how much, truly how much information is out there is clearly, I think, um, increasing that progression of, of non-religion. I think you see, and I think for, for communities of color, you know, if you're black non-believers are half free and talking about how ingrained religion was in those community and how much harder it is to leave um, or to express any doubt. So I think those are two communities in particular. I think the Muslim community as well uh, is much harder for that to happen. And so I think it, it, there's a privilege in being white and Christian um, in the U.S. that allows us to, to, to uh, be more skeptical, making it more skeptical to be easy. Um, where I think we need to we need to make sure when we're doing that to, for 
the people who don't have that being that bridge, being that open door, being that listening post um, to allow pe uh, communities of color to, to, to sort of use our privilege as a shield to help them along a little bit in their own journey, their own way, their own community, um, but to make that road a little bit easier because it is, it is a harder row, uh, a harder journey uh, for those communities as well. But yeah, I think the, what they're experiencing and what the values are, um, are completely different. And if you look, the, uh, I, the Episcopal Church in California, extremely progressive uh, and open and inclusive and those sorts of things where the Catholic Church not. Um, so, the, you know, the Pope going, uh, we okay, it's okay to have, you know, same-sex unions, uh, civil unions. And then the Catholic Church going, no, he didn't really mean that. Like, that, I'm sorry for younger people that just doesn't stand. And so that is one of the, the I think they're doing a great job of uh, helping deconvert uh, younger people just by their own hypocrisy and their non sense of inclusion. Am I being heard? Yes, uh, go ahead, uh, Mike. I'd like to throw in that you mentioned, uh, uh, I believe, in Arkansas putting in God We Trust in all classrooms. ACLU got that kicked. Yeah, th th and there's going to be a lot of legal work that goes through and, and doing all that, but there's still a project blitz and pushing that forward. I mean, that's organized and coordinated, and there's a, a built-in plan on how to how to implement that all. And the reality is it's, it's built on getting these small things in so we get used yeah. to them as a culture, and then we don't question them anymore. And so w we all have to keep questioning. And yeah, ACLU, American Atheist, uh, FFRF do some fantastic legal work. Um, we're currently exploring a joint uh, lawsuit against the Department of Education with American Atheists and American United for the Separation of State. Which is, they're leading it clearly because they have the lawyers and lobbyists. Um, about because uh, currently, uh, Betsy DeVos put in her recommendations so that um, in in public education, uh, religious student groups can get public funding and can not abide by the campus's non-discrimination policies, which clearly adversely affect people of, of minority religions, people of no religions, and, and specifically the LGBT community. So we, there may be a lawsuit coming soon uh, with that. My hope is that Biden's new, Biden's new Department of uh, Education will just undo that. Do you think we'll ever get under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance now that Russia's sort of no adapt. Uh, is that for, for me? Uh, that's gonna be a long road. Let's be real. <laughs> it's gonna be a long one. I mean, uh, Alabama or was it Mississippi? Alabama or Mississippi just devoted, just put it on their state flag in God We Trust. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, I guess uh, the, uh, I, I got one uh, last thing. Uh, do you have, uh, uh, do you have uh, stats on uh, what, uh, how the growth of the SSA over time, over the last few years and stuff? Oh, um, SSA has been, when we first started, SSA was really did sort of a, a ramp up. And so with from 2000, and clearly there were already uh, atheist, non-religious groups on college campuses. Um, and mm -hmm. In 2000, yeah. it really sort of went up quickly. Um, and we sort of hit our peak, I think it was right before sort of the, um, the big recession in, in 2008, a little bit after that. Um, and we started, seeing, we started seeing a decrease. And a little bit, I think, goes uh, as sort of Obama, or Obama's year, we started seeing a decrease in interest. And I think people felt safer. And, you know, uh, and uh, the separation of church, the wall, that wall was, was firm and we were you know i think we're as a society we're being more constructive of that uh and i think you clearly are seeing that the difference in that with the uh, four years of trump um i think is as as religious re, uh conservative religion continues to predominate especially some areas with our you know in our country and specific states we're going to see an increase in that need and we've definitely seen an increase uh over the last couple years the number of chapters has been increasing uh, last fall, we doubled the number of high school chapters, uh, and also last year is when we had our uh, uh, interest from middle school in starting chapters. So not only you know an, an increase, but also getting much and much younger. Um, and then last year, 
We had Baylor University. It's a small private school in Texas. You may be from in Waco. You may be familiar with that. Uh, they've been around for I think, at least 12 years. This may be year 13. They're not allowed to be recognized by their campus. They, they receive no funding. Um, so they sort of, they can't book a room. They can't have meetings that, you know, so they, they use a lounge in their student union to hold meetings and those sorts of things. Um, so they were for a long time, for at least a couple years, our only chapter at a private religious uh, university. And then last year, we all of a sudden were up to 12. So either religious or religious, you know, formerly religious uh, campuses. So we're definitely seeing an uh, increase in, in growth on all of those sorts of things. So multiple areas uh, of, of growth. So we see that all as, as good signs. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's really good. Um, uh, anyone else? All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin and uh, uh, Terry. Go ahead. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, you've given us a whole lot to think about and a lot to talk about at our board meeting on Thursday night. So thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do. Well, thank you very much, and glad to glad to be here, and you know, happy to anytime. I did throw the uh, link for the our 2020 scholarship recipients in the chat. So, if you want to get an idea of uh, secular students and what they're doing, uh, we, you know, those were like four page applications that we struck down to like two paragraphs. Um, and of course, the uh, student that um, that you all sponsored is there as well. Awesome. Let's take a, y'all take a look at that because they were some amazing, amazing applicants. Yes, definitely. So um, thanks again to Jimmy Smith, Kevin Bowling. And tonight, be sure to join us again for another Corona Conversation with Drs. Will Judy and Richard Andrews. Keep an eye out for future emails, Facebook posts, meet up, however you keep connected with us and for our future gatherings. Have a great week and stay safe out there. We'll see you next Sunday. Mm -hmm.